Well, you all know that I am a young man, but I am not as young as I used to be. And the main way that I remember that is how I try to keep my pinky toe dipped in in popular culture from the generation below me and how often I find myself totally in the dust of what's going on. It just doesn't make sense to me like it used to. But thankfully, my little sister-in-law, Jordan, is my guide, my Sherpa through the world of Generation Z. And so she'll send me TikTok videos sometimes and then explain their cultural or aesthetic significance to me. But this past week, I had the delight of explaining one to her that she sent me. She asked me if it was if it was true. It was a video of a, a graph of the 66 books of the Bible on a timeline, and it showed thin colored lines connecting different references in the Bible, forming this overarching uh, uh, big bow almost. And uh, this was. Uh, um, parts of Scripture that were directly, explicitly connected with quotes and references and allusions to other parts of the Bible. In all, there was over 63,000 connections in one part of the Scripture to the next. And so, as the presenter comments in, in talking about this, if this were the work of any other author, we would call them a literary genius. And this would be a dramatic masterpiece. But the fact is that this is a work authored by over 40 people in three different languages, on three different contents, under the empires of scores of different nations, uh, written over a dozen centuries. And that is absolutely miraculous, that it has the coherence that it does. And here this morning we find ourselves dead center in one of those explicit connections. We're in Hannah's song of praise, her very own Magnificat. It's a hymn to God's glory and grace that not only resounds throughout the rest of the Scriptures we find, but it resounds throughout eternity. Now last week we kicked off our time together in 1 Samuel uh, as a book that begins in a period not too unlike our own in some ways. It is a time of great social and spiritual chaos for the people of God. There is no unified front. There is no overarching leader. There are judges, but no real pastors in some sense. There's religion, but there's not much faith. And in the middle of the chaos of their everyday life, we're introduced to a married couple really a polygamist uh, group, family. And they're in the northern sticks and the outskirts of Israel's life. They seem to have no significant bearing on anything important in history whatsoever. They're a bunch of nobodies. The text makes sure that we know that. They don't have much going for them. And that is especially true for this one woman we meet named Hannah, the wife of Elkanah, and the rival of, by the world's standards, a much more successful Peninnah, his other wife. But ironically, Hannah's name means grace. And that's where the story really gets kicked off. Nothing about her life feels gracious, however. Peninnah, her rival, the Scriptures say, taunts her about her childlessness and therefore her kind of unstable situation. Elkanah tries but doesn't really understand her. And even her pastor, Eli, doesn't really seem to care by what problems beset this woman. But in the middle of her chaos, and the chaos of Israel in general, in the middle of the lifelessness, in the middle of the wilderness, Hannah begs God for grace and finds that God pours it out in overwhelming favor to her. Hannah gets her boy. She gets her son. But surprise, surprise, Hannah is so devout, she gives him right back to the Lord to be his servant. And so at the end of last week's passage, we saw Hannah take a, an animal sacrifice and some bread and some wine to the tabernacle at Shiloh so that her son could be initiated into 
uh, uh, into uh, professional service of the Lord. And so the last verse of, of, of last week confirms for us that indeed Samuel stayed there and he worshipped the Lord. Now in God's story, chaos always gives way to purpose. And hopelessness always gives way to joyful worship. And so today, that's exactly what this passage is all about too. It's the worship of a good and loving God who uplifts the lowly. He is a great God who yet magnifies the nobodies and therefore magnifies His own greatness. And so, as we look at our passage this morning, I want to look specifically or think specifically about that word magnify. It comes from the Latin word magnificat. In fact, that's where we get when we describe Mary's song in Luke's Gospel in the first chapter there, we call it the Magnificat because she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. And that's the word that we use. It's a, it's a, a, um, a moment in history where Mary, out of the, again, the, 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 an anonymity, the nothingness that she brings to God, she's just seemingly to our eyes a random girl that's in a small, you know, goat shepherding town in the middle of the, the rural part of Israel. And yet, she gets this incredible life-changing news. And she sings this Magnificat. It's a responsive hymn that she sings after Gabriel delivers that message that she, just a poor and lowly girl from obscurity, not unlike Hannah, has found favor and grace from the Lord. For Mary, she will be the mother of the Messiah. The ancient word uh, that the Greeks use is theotokos. She'll be the God-bearer. This woman will bear God in the flesh into the world. She's the woman who will bring about the last, or the new man rather, and she's the next Eve that will bring about the last Adam. And she was no one. And Mary said, we read, in that part of Scripture, my soul magnifies, magnificates the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Savior because He looked on me with favor. Same idea from Hannah. He looked on me with grace. On the humble condition of His servant, surely now all generations will call me blessed because the Mighty One has done great things for me. The not Mighty One we might put in parenthetically. And His name is holy. And she continues on, describing the character of the Lord. His mercy is from generation to generation. From Hannah to Mary. From Mary to Maranatha. On those who fear Him. He has done a mighty deed with His arm. He scatters the proud because of the thoughts of their heart. And He topples the mighty from their thrones and exalts the lowly instead. He satisfied, or he satisfied the hungry with good things, but he sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering his mercy to Abraham and his descendants, we know both physical and spiritual forever, just as he spoke to our ancestors, and in this case, Hannah especially. Now, the passage that I just read to you from Luke's Gospel sounds very similar to the passage that Sarah just read for us a few moments ago, doesn't it? And I don't think that's an accidental part of the story. Again, this is one of those intentional connections we find in Scripture. I think that Mary, reaching back into the history and the holy writ of Israel, finds the words to pray in response to God's goodness from people like Hannah, from the other saints of Israel. She remembers what God has done for them in the past, how they were lowly and yet have been exalted, and she knows that for herself, although she is lowly, God will exalt her in her obedience. And so praising and worshiping God pours forth for how He's always working out salvation for little 
ordinary people like us. We forget that these characters in the Bible that we elevate to the role of saints, that we know they have their flaws and peccadilloes, but we look at them as if they're supernatural, as if they're aliens, if they're, as if they're not just regular people like you and I. The only reason we know about them is because God lifted them up. Not because there was anything significant in their own history or pedigree or anything like that. And so if God does that for them, how will we not see that God is doing that for us as well? So let's look line by line at Hannah's hymn, This New Mother's Magnificat. And I'm sorry, fathers. We're going to be talking about mothers this morning on Father's Day. Hannah's song we read is also a prayer. She begins praying it. And that teaches us, I think, that worship, singing joyfully, and supplication go hand in hand. There is a thin line between praying and praising. And she sings and says in verse 1, she says, my heart rejoices in the Lord. Just like Mary started. My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is lifted up by the Lord. My mouth boasts over my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Remember, when we first met Hannah, she was one that was weeping bitterly. That's what, how we first saw her. But now she says her heart is lifted sky high, rejoicing in the Lord. And when we first met Hannah, she was socially weak. She didn't have any children. She didn't have any cultural leverage or anything. But now the Lord has lifted up her horn. The physical image that's being described there is a, is a bull after having, gory, having gored its opponent lifting up its head in triumph and victory. Hannah, although lowly and, and simple, is like a mighty bull, powerful and virile. And Penina, her rival, her enemy, who once humiliated her, she now boasts over that rival. Not because of anything Hannah's done, or Hannah is, but because the Lord has chosen her to bring about His salvation for her and those that will be affected by her in the future. What an incredible exaltation of such a lowly person we get here. She truly is like Mary because Hannah is blessed and highly favored. And people will talk about her forever. Here she is, this historical woman now, at least, I gosh, probably over 3,000 years old, and here we are still talking about this pauper from a country that nobody knew about. And she's like the sister of Moses, Miriam, who goes out of her, the, her period of enslavement. Not literally in Hannah's case, but slavery to social expectations, slavery to, to disappointment. She goes out liberated by the Lord singing and rejoicing in the Lord's empowerment. This barren pauper whom God made uh, into a goring bull. She is the mother of a judge and a prophet. And that is absolutely an astounding turnaround. But Hannah's life change, her success, and even her glory, we might say, is not found in herself. See, we hear this rhetoric in our day and age from every avenue. We all know this. It's, it's cliche. It's hackney. It's rote. But in our day and age, which is always looking for self-empowerment, self-fulfillment, self-actualization, we look for our identity and meaning and, and, and worth and who we are and the biblical understanding of the value of human beings, the worth of human beings, is that they are image bearers and reflections of God's glory and grace. See, the reality is, everybody in this room, everybody in this community, everybody in this state, this nation, this world, is valuable. Everyone. But their value is tied to the fact that once they were nothing, and yet God has now made them His image bearer. 
They might be far from the Lord. They might be weak in the faith. They may be even openly rebellion and rebellion and enemies of God. But their value is in connection to God's making them in His image. And so while it is good that we're, we're kind and compassionate and uplifting and encouraging to people because they are beloved of the Lord, our value is never ultimately finally derived just in ourselves, but in ourselves in relation to God. Now here's the beauty of that. Is that if we are obedient and trusting in the Lord, we're worshiping Him and giving Him the glory. He glorifies and lifts us up in ways that we, if we spent all our lives cloying and clawing our way to the top, trying to be everything to all people, He lifts us up even further than we could possibly ever lift ourselves. That's the beauty of it. We see this model in Jesus, who although He was God Himself, didn't count that as a thing to be grasped or exploited, but gave it all away so that He might become a servant, even a servant unto the point of death on a cross. And yet, through His humiliation, that's how God turns it now into exaltation. It works the way, same way for His church. Hannah's success, her glory, her life change, everything is found in and through the God she worships. The God who loves her and graces her. Which explains the focus of these next or the rest of the song, really. There is no one holy like the Lord. There's no one beside you. And there is no rock like our God, verse 2 says. Hannah highlights the reason why her life is so terrific now is because God is uniquely great. Her life is not good if God is not God. That's a good lesson for us to learn today. There is no God like Him. He is above and beyond all we can imagine or think. Or as Anselm once famously wrote a thousand years ago in his dense ontological argument for God, God is that being which no greater can be conceived. (laughs) The greatest possible thing that we can imagine, God is above and beyond that and even greater. Yahweh has no counterpart neither in heaven or on earth. Hannah says He's holy. That means He's above all sin and evil. That He's utterly unique in His character. But yet also, in the same breath, she says He's the rock. Which means He's the foundation upon which we're built. And He's also the shelter that keeps sin and evil and hell and death out of our lives in the first place. See, He's both holy and yet He's our protector as well. He's just and yet He's loving. Therefore, Hannah reminds us in verse 3, so don't boast so proudly or let arrogant words come out of your mouth, for the Lord is the God of all knowledge and all actions are weighed by Him. If the Lord is who Hannah claims He is, then none of us can speak pridefully or arrogantly about anything in our lives. Not our heritage, not our success, not our family, not our achievements, nothing. Yahweh is the God of all knowledge. He's the God of all action. Everything we say or think or do falls under His jurisdiction. There is no good thing in this world, nor is there an evil thing in this world that He will not ultimately sit in judgment over. All of our wonderful innovations and artistic achievements as the human race, He assesses. Simultaneously, all of our inhuman abuses and selfish and greedy violences, well, He weighs that out in the end too. No one escapes either His mercy or His justice. Everybody answers to the Lord. So may we Christians who live in a national superpower and a time and place that feels like well, we don't have to answer to anybody because we're in the, the greatest country to ever live. 
May we not lose sight of the fact that our prestige and our preeminence on the world stage for good or for ill will be held accountable by Him. We like to brag about who we are, but remember, verse 4 says, the bows of the warriors are broken, but the feeble are clothed with strength. You know, I think about this all the time in the context of some of the missionaries we support. I think of specifically this morning of the Rochelles. See, they're in a a, a place in Western Africa that most of us know nothing about. When's the last time you've heard of Bobo and Burkina Faso being mentioned on the news? The answer is never. Before the Rochelles, most of us didn't even know Burkina Faso was a country. And yet, there they are in West Africa, a very different part of the world, and men and women and children are coming to faith in Jesus Christ in droves. There are people that are being called into ministry. There are missionaries and pastors and preachers and prophets coming out of these people who have been baptized and now confess and celebrate the Lord both now and forever. They can hardly get a building, a church building built over there before it's being filled up and they're having to build another one. And remember, none of us has ever heard of Burkina Faso before. And yet, the Lord truly is clothing the feeble with strength. But look at our nation. Look at our society. We are a cultural and military powerhouse. Everything in this world has some connection and tethering to the United States. Our economy, our culture, our military, our science, everything is affected by this nation. But look how we have shrinking churches filled with spiritually lazy and even worse, mean as snakes, hypocrites. You know, I, I'm just I, I'm going to step on some toes this morning. But if we're more interested in boycotting Target or Bud Light or Chick-fil-A than we are in coming to prayer meeting, then it's no wonder why He's breaking our bow here in the United States. If we're more interested in who we vote for than we are in praying for our enemies, it's no mystery why churches in America are emptying out. Because although we claim with our lips we believe and preach this Gospel, our lives show a very different reality. And so Hannah puts it in verse 5, those who are full, what can Americans be described as? Is full. Goodness gracious. Every day, we have to decide what not to eat. Not what to eat. We don't, have to go, we don't have to go looking for food. We have to look for where we can fit all the food in our house. We eat until we're stuffed. And yet those people, in the end, Hannah says, will hire themselves out for food. <laughs> They'll have nothing in the end. They'll do anything. They'll sell their bodies, their souls, just for a bite of bread. But those who are starving will hunger no more. The woman who is childless, that has no social advantage, will give birth to seven. A complete and full number. And by the way, we'll learn this next week. Hannah, who had Samuel, couldn't have a child, finally has Samuel and then gives him away. The Lord gives her a bunch more kids. Boys and girls after that. But the woman with many sons pines away. See, the Lord is filling up the physical and spiritual needs of people all over the world, even this second. There are churches in West Africa and East Asia and and Oceania and South America and, and little corners of Europe. There's places all over this world where the Lord is filling up His people. While many of us American Christians starve to death, spiritually speaking, because our whole diet consists of cable news and social media, and we never open the Scriptures, and we never actually listen to the One or go to the One who can tell it to us straight and feed us what we need. 
And it's no wonder we're starving. Our churches, which once were thriving and bustling in this land, are shrinking and shriveling because we'd rather sweep the pastoral sex scandals and abuses we hear and the racial prejudices that we hear, we'd rather sweep that stuff under the rug than be biblical Christians who deny ourselves, repent and serve one another, and in turn welcome all sinners. And so we'll become like this woman who pines away for all of our wayward children. Why, aren't our, why don't our children come to church? We drove them out of the church through our culture warring instead of drawing them in through our worship of the Lord. See, that's what just breaks my heart today more than anything. I see, I see so many Christians just run their mouths about, well, did you see what this company did? Or I'm not giving them my money or doing this stuff. And, and acting as if any of that matters. And yet, we won't come to church. We won't give. We won't volunteer. We won't serve. We won't sing. We won't pray. We won't worship the Lord. And we wonder why this is all falling apart. We can never forget, as Hannah sings in verse 6, that the Lord brings death, but He also gives life. He does send some down to Sheol. But he also raises others up. You know, as I was thinking about this, it reminded me of how the Lord Jesus Himself in these mystical letters that He writes to seven churches in Revelation, He deals with them harshly. He looks at the church at Ephesus and He says, you've done a great job and everything else, but you've forgotten how to love and so I'm going to remove my lampstand from you. Their doctrine is great. Their theology is great. And they can't stand each other. They gossip and bite and sneer. And the Lord says, I want to remove my light altogether from you. Or to the church in Thyatira, who seem churchy on the outside, but they tolerate all sorts of immorality on the inside. They have great songs and worship services, but their leadership and their lay people do whatever they want with their bodies and, and, and exploit whoever they want with their bodies. And so the Lord says, He'll deal with you too. Or to the Laodiceans who can't go one way or the other. They won't be hot or cold. They choose the safe path of comfort and convenience over faithfulness to the Savior. And He says, I'll vomit you out. All of these people, Jesus loves dearly. All of these churches are people for whom He died. He desires to give them life. And He speaks to them with warning saying, don't go that way. It is leading to death. He's not writing to them. He's not speaking to them because He doesn't care. He's telling them that because He cares deeply. He wants them to come back around. He wants them to experience the fullness of joy. But if they won't repent and instead continue in their selfishness and living life with arrogance and braggadocia and greed and all these different things, well, Hannah says the Lord brings death just as much as He gives life. He'll send some down to the realm of the dead and while He'll raise others up out of it. The Lord can bring poverty to the rich, and He can give wealth away to the poor. He can humble a church or a people, or He can exalt them. And for Hannah, she can testify as in verse 8 that He does raise the poor up out of the dust of sadness. He does lift the needy out of the trash heap of being a social outcast. And He sits them instead on a throne with nobles and honorable people in history. And He can do that because, she says, the foundation of the earth are the Lord's. He has set the world on them. Everything that we think we're in control of, everything that we think we 
own or belongs to us or is a right or something that we demand, all of that belongs to the Lord. The wealth we have, the health we have, the life we have, the love we have, all of that is given freely by the Lord. And just as freely, He can take it away. And sometimes He does that to ungrateful, ungrateful religious people who bear His name in vain. The Lord that Hannah sings to, the Lord that we sang to this morning in these wonderful songs and hymns, is absolutely sovereign in all matters of life and death physical and spiritual, historical and supernatural. He's the one whom the 19th century Dutch Reformed theologian Abraham Kuyper once wrote, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. And so this God, this absolute sovereign, the way He chooses to rule is to be kind and gracious to simple people who respond in faith and obedience. That's how God rules. He gives generously to those who trust and obey. Because there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. And in the end, verse 9, He guards the steps of the faithful ones, but the wicked perish in darkness. For a person does not prevail by his own strength. And all of this leads to Hannah's final stanza, which is also a kind of prophetic foreshadowing. Remember, this is the day and age of judges. There is no king in Israel and everyone does what is right in his own eyes. That's the era that we're living in. But in verse 10, she sees something coming on the horizon. Something that she prophesies about but can't fully see. She says, those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. He will thunder in the heavens against them. And this is where it especially gets interesting. But the Lord will judge the ends of the earth and He will give power to His King. And He will lift up His horn of His anointing. Now the rest of the book of Samuel will explore the ups and downs, the triumphs and transgressions on Israel's bumpy road to a monarchy. We'll learn that the Lord gives them a king even though He says they have rejected Him as king. (laughs) He'll give them a king. And we'll see that although that king starts off good, Saul, he goes off a cliff pretty quickly. And then David comes along. And he seems like a great king, but in the end of his life we see that he's pretty lousy in his own way. And even Solomon, the wisest man to ever live, arguably when, the most, when Israel was at its most scientifically advanced, uh, artistically uh, uh, meritorious, and its most militarily powerful, economically dominant, even Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, loses his way in the end. But God does have a way of redeeming our sins and making them into something special. You know, when God plants humanity, He puts them in a garden. And by their own sin and neglect, they go instead of a garden and build a city. That's totally against God's design for how He wants to rule the earth. But isn't it amazing in the grace and providence of the Lord that when we get to the end of history, we see that God puts us not in just a garden, but a garden city. (laughs) The thing that we use to rebel against Him, He redeems so it will be uh, continuing on forever and ever, but made right. The same is true with kings. We rebel against the rulership of the Lord. We want uh, our own human king. And how many kings and presidents and prime ministers and Leaders do we have to go through in our history before we learn these people aren't going to save us. Not a single one of them can. And yet God still does give us a human king. And His name is Jesus. See, we'll trace out all the corrupt paths of the priest Eli and we'll follow the righteous moments of the 
prophet Samuel. And we'll watch the fall of King Saul and in, the con- in conjunction with the rise of King David. And power will be given and power will be taken away. Anointing will be bestowed and its blessing will be revoked. But the point of all of it and the point of Hannah's song and Mary's Magnificat, Magnificat is the same. To magnify the Lord. Folks, let me tell you. The Lord is most magnified, most glorified, most realized in the person and work and the rule and reign of King Jesus of Nazareth. The Son of God and yet the Son of David. And even more obscure than that, the Son of Joseph the carpenter and Mary the maiden. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And He is the world's judge. And yet, the Scriptures show He's also our Advocate. He's the prophet who's wrapped in flesh and bone. And He is the great High Priest who gives us His own breath and life at the expense of His own. And the good news of all of this is that in all our injustices and iniquities and idolatries, all of that is resolved and redeemed in Him. Verse 11 tells us that Elkanah goes home to Ramah. Hannah concludes her prayer and the boy Samuel stays behind to serve the Lord under Eli, who is just a rascal of a man. And so, as the story comes to the close, we too can come to a close and rest. And our hearts like Hannah's may rejoice. Why? Because she reminds us that Jesus is our salvation. And it turns out that's a song worth singing. Let's pray. Lord, help our hearts to sing of Your salvation. Give us the faith and wisdom of Hannah and life's hardest troubles and sweetest triumphs. Lift us up in our grief and raise us from our shame. Give us the breath to sing Your praises both now and always. For it's in Jesus' name and Your Son and our Lord we pray now and always. Amen.